check this out. This is this spinning handle. So it's a T handle in the space station. So it's in a you know zero gravity environment, whatever you want to call it. And so when if you spin it and it comes out, it comes out of the screw and it's still spinning, but watch what happens. It spins and then it flips and it spins the other way, then it flips and spins back the other way, then it flips, and that's pretty awesome. So this is a classic uh, problem of uh, rotation of rigid objects, and I want to make a model for this. And I'm going to make a model for it, because I already did, but I'm gonna explain how I did that. Okay, so let's just talk about uh, the rotation of rigid objects and how you would deal with this. Let me switch over to the pay-per-view. Uh, so, oops, I didn't even line this up, my fault. Okay, so if I have a rigid object, and the, the simplest rigid object I can make is, is um, would well, be one point, but let's say I have three points. Now, I'm gonna model this as three points. That's my T handle, right? It's like this. So I'm gonna put a point there, a point there, and a point there. If I have a rotating rigid object uh, where the torque is zero, if the torque is zero, then the angular momentum should be constant. So first, if this is first rotating this way, then let's say, I'm gonna rotate with that the axis, so it's spinning this way. That's the angular velocity. And you would think the angular momentum is in the same direction, and it probably is. However, they don't have to always be in the same direction. So this is my relationship between the angular velocity of a rigid object and the angular momentum of a rigid object. Uh, I mean, really, angular momentum is R cross P, uh, where R is the position of each element in that, and P is the momentum of each element. But they all, if this is rotating, all the points in here have different uh, momentum vectors because it's going in different directions. But they could have the same angular velocity, uh, and they, they could have uh, a total angular momentum. And this is the relationship between those. But I, the moment of inertia, is not a scalar object. It's actually a tensor. It's this. So when I take this thing and multiply it by this vector, the resultant angular momentum does not have to be in the same direction. Okay, so it, it's a complicated problem. Uh, and so you could find the elements of each of each element in this tensor with this, right? I x x is going to be the total each mass times its y position squared plus its z position squared, and then uh, for i y y it'd be each x position squared plus its y position squared, and then for the the other elements x y it'd be just x times y. Uh, z is x times z and so forth, then there's a negative sign. But that, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this numerically. I want to do this uh, with the momentum principle. So the momentum principle says this, f net equals dp dt. So if I could, if I have only forces on three masses, can I get this spinning handle thing to work? And the answer is yes. Okay. So for my, quote, rigid object, I'm going to have these three masses connected by springs. So can I get these three masses connected by springs to do the same thing as a spinning handle? And I've already said the answer is yes. So now the question is just how do we do that? Okay, let's start over again with my three masses. And let's call this A, B, and C. I think that's what I call it in my program. I can't remember. So each of these masses has a position. Uh, and there's a vector from each mass to the other one. I'll call this R, A to C. I'll call this R, B to C. And I'll call this R, B to A. We can model a spring force. It depends on the position of these two masses. I can say, F k is negative k, I guess I'd call it S, negative k L minus L0 L hat. So L would be the vector from the beginning to the end of the spring, which would be this, R A C. L0 is the unstretched length of the spring. And then L hat is a vector pointing in the direction of L. So I can set, I can set all these masses in the right location and then I can set up springs. 
Now, if I give these things momentum and this gets moved a little bit, these two springs are gonna get stretched and it's gonna pull it back. So the question is, if I model the initial motion, can I get the whole thing to work? And the answer is yes, but there's a couple tricks here. Okay, so the first thing is I need to pick the mat, the locations of all the masses and set the unstretched length of the spring to the initial position. Because imagine if this thing is really stretched, this thing's gonna wobble all over the place and it's not gonna look really great. It's still gonna wobble, okay? But I want to reduce the wobbling. So I want the unstretched length to be equal to the initial position of these things. Now, what about the initial velocities of the objects? That is tough. Okay, so let's, let's think about it this way. Suppose that this is my center of mass and I want this to rotate this way. So this one will have, we'll call that RC and this will be, I'll call it BC. This one is RA and that is VA. And this one is RB and I'll call that VB. So clearly there should be some relationship between the, if this is, has a constant angular velocity of omega, let's see, I'm in the positive z direction, equals, let's say, zero, zero, 0,01 radians per second. And I know the position vectors of all these, I should be able to find the velocities, and I can. So I could say VC equals, let's see, R, is it R cross, yeah, no, omega, is it omega cross r? I got that backwards, let me see. I forget it, I can't remember why. It is omega cross r. So this is gonna be omega cross r c. So this is the vector cross product. Um, I don't wanna go into this too much detail, but if you use the right hand rule, let's use some, some pins here. So this, this is c, so there's r c is this way. Omega C is this way. So omega cross R would be perpendicular to that and it'd be in that direction. And it turns out that this doesn't just work in a flat plane, it works for any three dimensional object, which I actually have technically a two dimensional object, but that's fine. And so here, this one's gonna be going that way and that one's gonna be going that way. And the further away they are, the slower it would go, right? Um, is that true? No, the faster it would go. The greater the r, the faster it go in order to make this thing keep rotating at a constant velocity. So once I know their positions and I set the initial springs up, I can set up their initial velocity and their initial momentum. And so then everything should rotate fine. Now what do we do after that? Now we use the Euler method. So this says if I break this into small time steps, I can say F net is the change in momentum over the change in time. And I can assume that the momentum is constant. I mean, the force is constant. Then this would be P2 minus P1 over delta T. So this is the momentum at the end of the time interval. This is the momentum at the beginning of the time interval. If I solve this for P2, I get P2 equals F P1 plus F net delta t. And so this says I calculate the force, assume it's constant, I multiply it by the time interval, and I use that to find the new momentum at the end of the time interval. I can do the same thing assuming the velocity is constant, which it's not, and I can find the new position along the same idea, r2 equals r1 plus p, I'll say it, p2 over m, delta t. So p2 over m is the velocity at the end of the time interval, and if I add that to R, the position at the beginning of the time interval, multiply that by delta T, I get the final position. So once I do this, I can go back up here and calculate the net force and then repeat the whole thing for all three masses. And so by breaking this into time steps, I can model the motion of this complicated system with just forces in the momentum principle and springs. Okay, I think, I think let's jump to the program. And that's, this is the Euler method, and there are better methods to do this, but this is the simplest. Let's jump to the program and take a look at what I have. So I'm gonna show you the first case of a rotation about this axis through the center mass, and I already have this working. So let me run this, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so can you, I should turn this camera off. 
there. Okay, so let's run this. So here's my masses right there, my three masses, and I have it rotating. This Actually, this is rotating in the negative z direction, but, but we can deal with that. So you see right there, this is a rotating rigid object, and there are no, uh, I don't use the moment of inertia tensor, I don't use the angular velocity except to set the initial conditions. So let's go through the program and look at the important points. Uh, and I do have some sloppy code up here, and that's fine. I'll make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so this stuff right here just makes, all this stuff just makes a graph, which I'll show you in a little bit. Um, these are my initial conditions for my T-handle. Uh, so the length of the T-handle, S1, uh, S2 is the, uh, the, the length the other way. And then I have two masses at the end are the same, and the other mass is the same. So I have two, two different masses, M1s and M2s. Omega is my angular velocity vector. You can see I had to have it in the negative Z direction. We can change that. Let's put that at 2. should still work. See, it works. Um, M is, I don't even know what that's for. Uh, K is a spring constant. So imagine what would happen if I have a very uh, unstiff spring, if I change that down to 200. So, you know, it's pretty cool, but you see they wobble a lot more. Okay, so a stiffer spring constant with a higher, a smaller time interval is going to give a better result. So you, this is something that you can definitely play with. And I found 2000 works, seems to work fine. And you can see there's still a little jiggle in those wires. They are, they are jiggling. Jiggling is a technical term, okay? But they are jiggling. Uh, now this center of mass right here, I calculate that uh, and then went back and put it in there. I wanted to uh, determine the position based on uh, some center mass. So I actually put the objects in a position and then I found the center mass and then went back up here and changed this in the code, which isn't necessarily the best way to do it. I get it, but I did it anyway. Okay, so now I have three masses, mass A, B, and C. So each one is a sphere. I give it a position uh, with relative to the center mass uh, and the color and all that stuff. Make trails true. Uh, and if you leave this retain equals, uh, it's like 50. That just says how many data points to keep. I give it a mass. And then here is that calculation of the initial velocity. So I start with that angular velocity omega and I take the cross product which is built in to Python of uh, omega cross r that is it and I get my velocity and then I need my momentum so I get the momentum and there you go do the same thing for B do the same thing for C except down here I actually cheated I made I just made the momentum of C opposite of B plus A so that the total momentum is zero uh, and I don't know why it didn't work if I did it just Omega cross C, but that it, it would still rotate, but it would move, and I'm and I didn't figure I didn't think about it too hard, but that was that. These are the vectors from the three masses, right? I have three position vectors from A to B, B to C, and C to A. That's pretty easy, uh, and that's why I calculated the, the center mass, and then I put it up there at the top. Um, okay, so then I I make these three springs to visually see them as cylinders. That's all that is. And these are the unstretched lengths of the three pieces. Okay, so if I, move, if I put a piece in a different location, it'll start with a different initial length. Uh, the time interval you see is one, one thousandth of a second. So you do want that pretty small. And that L0, I don't think it's used. I don't even know why it's there. So sometimes you write a code and you don't know what you're doing and you come back and then you know, you're like, what did I do? Uh, rate 1000 says to do, uh, so I'm doing this for three seconds. So this, I could change that to whatever I want. Let's say, well, let's leave it at three. Rate 1000 says don't do more than 1000 calculations every second. Um, so since I have a time rate of one one thousandth of a second, this would make it run in real time, if it can run in real time. If there's too many calculations and it can't run in real time, then it doesn't do it. It just goes as fast as it can. So in each, this is a loop where in each, the first thing I need to do is recalculate these vectors RAB, RBC, and RCA because all the positions may have moved from the previous calculations. So I need those values to calculate the spring forces and here are the spring forces. I have FAB, that's the force of A on B, B on C, and C on A. I don't need to calculate six, I only need three because the other three are opposites of these. Here is the momentum principle for all three where I update the momentum and then I update the position of all three. 
and then I update the spring. So you have to update the location of the spring and the axis of the spring. And that's just a visual thing. Uh, L, hmm. A cross P. Oh, this is the angular momentum. I'll, that's the angular momentum of the objects. So don't confuse it with this LAB, which is the length of the springs to begin with. That's the angular momentum. Uh, so I, R cross P, I calculated the angular momentum the old way of each one just to show that the total angular momentum is constant. Uh, and then I update time and I plot the Z components of angular momentum. And let's look at that graph. So here you can see the total angular momentum right here, the black line is indeed constant. That's what we want. Uh, the, the angular momentum of the masses change uh, and that's fine. And they, they squiggle around a little bit because they're oscillating. But even with the oscillation, angular momentum is conserved. So, so we won. So we have, we have our rotating thing, but we don't have a flipping handle. A flipping handle, right? Get it? Flipping handle, okay. So this is the same program. But there's only one difference. Uh, up here, I have the angle, let's put the angular velocity in the x direction, exactly in the x direction. And I'm gonna run it. And so you see that's, that's what it looks like. That's my spinning handle. But it's an unstable spin. If I give it a little bit of angular velocity in the, let's say, y direction. So if I change this initial angular velocity to, uh, so it's angled up a little bit, let's see what happens. See, it flips over. So the angular momentum is constant. It's just the angular velocity is changing. You can't work backwards. You can't say, oh, I know the velocities. I can find the angular momentum. I mean, the angular velocity. You can't do that, okay? The cross product is not undoable. Uh, and only in certain cases. I tried, I, I didn't realize you couldn't do it. Uh, but if you look down here, you can see the angular momentum is indeed constant, even though the angular velocity is doing some weird stuff. Okay. Um, so I think I'm gonna stop there. Uh, I will say one thing that I'm going to do is to calculate what happens for this moment of inertia tensor as time goes on. As time goes on and these positions are in new locations, the moment of inertia tensor is different, right? So every time interval, there's a new moment of inertia tensor. So you can use that moment of inertia tensor to actually solve for the angular velocity, uh, but, but I'm gonna do that in, in a separate video. But the, the key here is that yes, you can indeed model the motion of this spinning and flipping handle without using angular momentum, with only using forces. And that's a pretty important idea, right? Angular momentum is mostly a tool that allows us to treat more complicated systems uh, without having to deal with each individual point. But if you could deal with each individual point, you could do it without angular momentum. Okay, so I'm gonna include the links to these two codes below. Uh, there's a video from uh, Derek Mueller at Veritasium that goes over this problem. I thought it was really great. Uh, and then there's an original video that I found that shows a spinning handle in, uh, in in the space station and I'll include that too. Uh, so I hope you like that. You, uh, did I say I'm gonna give you the code? I'm giving you the code. Okay, so, and I do have sloppy code. It's not the best, I apologize for that, but there you go, that's that. I will talk to you guys later.